Okay, welcome back everybody. Those of you watching this, uh, the canned version online, um, this is day two of the official summit. And we are going to start out with a presentation by Chuck Hodge, member of the National Technical Commission and National Commissaire on radio usage. Um, and I'm hoping I can learn something because everyone tells me I do it wrong all the time. Great. Thanks, Sean. Everybody hear me in the back okay? So the uh, last PowerPoint presentation I did in Colorado, I got engaged at. So I promise, <laughs> I promise that's not going to happen today. And uh, by the way, for those of you who haven't asked yet, October 12th of this year. So, <clears throat> one who, uh, I bugged Sean to do this presentation, uh, work a lot of events around the country. My real job is I'm the technical director for Medal of Sports, do a lot of events around the country. One thing I've seen, I think you all have seen, is uh, how important communications are, uh, especially two-way radio communications at events whether that's event operations, whether it's us as officials out there working. Uh, what I want to do today is not go through things like how to do time splits. I want to give you all some, for lack of a better term, theory on how radios work. There's going to be a little bit of geekiness involved here, but what I want to do is empower you all so that when you go to an event and are asking about the radio system or how it works, et cetera, et cetera, that you have some idea what the heck people are talking about. Just like us as officials, we have our own language we use. Uh, radio geeks do as well. And I uh, want to try to translate some of that for you today so you know what to look for as you go into an event and know what the heck people are talking about. So a few things we're going to learn. What the heck's a frequency and how is it different from a channel? These are things I've seen that really confuse officials at events. Some common radio types and frequencies that you'll be exposed to out there. Basically, why won't my radio talk to the radio of the person standing across from me? Give you a few ways to troubleshoot that and avoid that to begin with. A little bit on repeaters. Everybody talks about them. No one knows what the heck a repeater does, or a few of you may, a few of you don't. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about some ways to better hear other people and be heard at bike races. Really critical stuff. So... Go a little bit into, I'm going to start out with some theory and then we'll get into some practicality. So we measure frequencies in megahertz. And I'll get into why this is practical a little bit. Again, this is theory type stuff. At bike races, we use this whole spectrum of stuff. And I'm going to go through with you sort of what works and what doesn't at bike races in a little bit. But I want to expose you to a little bit of the broad spectrum you'll run into. So... You guys deal with this every day, and I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, there was very little usage of two-way radio. You know, right now, I think everybody's got one of these in their pockets. This is an amazing little piece of technology. It's a quad-band radio is the way I look at it. It uses four different frequency ranges from 800 to 2100 megahertz. Geeky stuff, I know. Everybody's got one of these. Half of you are on the wireless network in here. That uses wireless spectrum. This uh, mic I'm wearing, I happen to look at it, 540 megahertz. It's using wireless spectrum. So what's going on here is where 20 years ago, this big piece of electronic spectrum we had wasn't used. Now it is just flooded with stuff. And that's actually impacting us as race officials, believe it or not. So where do we see this? WSB, radio in Atlanta. You guys all have this in your car. This is actually the frequency. WSB is 95.5 on your FM dial. It's 95.500 megahertz. And I'll show you how that relates to you. This is their AM equivalent right there. So this is stuff you guys actually see every day, may not think about. So I want to throw this up here. We're going to get geeky for about five minutes before we come back into real world. That is the RF spectrum for the United States. Why do you need to know this? I just thought I'd throw it up there to show you we're not the only ones using this stuff. When you print this out, it's 42 inches long, so you can actually read it in six-point font. And we're dealing today with these little yellow blocks right here. To give you an idea of what all is in here, that's FM radio, uh, that's TV, broadcast TVs in there. Wi-Fi is somewhere up in here. 
This is all cell phone stuff. We have these little slices right in here we're dealing with. What I want to talk to you guys today about is why you want to end up in these two places when you're dealing with your local races, when you're dealing with your association stuff. So what's the frequency look like? That's a very common frequency we use at bike races, believe it or not. I'll tell you what that means in English later. And that's how we say it. 462.6125 megahertz. Okay, geeky stuff, but we'll get into usage here in a minute. So what happened, is everybody in here worked with an FRS radio before, one of the little handy talkies? Okay, there's 14 channels on those. I'll get into this in a little bit. These are actually the frequencies those match up to. <clears throat> so uh, you go to Disney World and every mom and dad has a little FRS radio and they're all on channel one. How does that sound? <clears throat> yeah. When I used to uh, drive the Mavic support motor at Philly, we had our radios and we would be at the Kelly Drive section of the course and over, all of a sudden over our radios we would hear, we need towels in room 322. <laughs> <laughs> the hotel with us was using the same frequency we were. And that's one thing I want to get at here is when you're looking at local association or using radios at races is all that spectrum we had, we end up with like 10 or 15 frequencies we use, and a lot of people use them. So you're ending up having to sort of deal with that. One way they fix that is what we call a tone. I think most of you have seen those little FRS radios. We'll privacy code on there, so you have channels and you have a code. That's the sort of dumbed down version of it, and it's a tone. These were invented because frequencies get congested. You have everybody on that channel one, and they're all going to hear everybody else. So what that is is when you key your radio, besides that, it sends a little code along, and the other radio won't receive unless you get that. I'm going to throw these out just so you see them. There's some common names for them. Everybody's trademarked this. They're basically analog and digital, and these are standard, and it's expressed a couple different ways. Who here has a programmable radio to use motors? Okay. Is the, are those numbers making sense to you now, Andy? Okay. <laughs> and FRS use these quite a bit. So now we express the frequency with a tone. So these are the two things you need to figure out what channel, et cetera, you're using. So we're getting out of theory now and getting into practicality. So you're going to a bike race. There's some common types of radios you're going to encounter out there. CB radio. Anybody still use these at events? If your race director says we're using CBs, run screaming the other way. All I got to say. The two you're going to see most are VHF and UHF radios at events. Okay, and these are the frequency ranges that they're in. Right here. Who's worked Revlins before? Okay, they swear the radios are going to work this year. <laughs> and they're on what's called an 800 system. I'll get into a little of that. Very proprietary police type radios. Most intents and purposes, you guys will be working with these two things right here, and I'll talk about the differences between those in a little bit. Who uh, uses local association radios? Okay, Judy, do you know what we have? Okay. They're UHF. Anybody know they use VHF stuff? Who works with Mabra? You have VHF. Okay. What's that? Yeah. Your VHF, that's right. So I'll get into why that's important, because if I come into your region, I'm going to want to know some basics about your radios, especially as a motor, so I can program them. What are channels? It's just an arbitrary designation. The best way I want to give this is I worked for my city for years, and we had public works radios, and we had police radios, and they had the same channels in them. So channel one on my radio was one frequency, and channel one on the police radio was another. 
So if you put them both on channel one, you couldn't talk to each other. Channel three on the police radio was the same as channel one. Everybody get that? They're arbitrary. And those can be names or those can be numbers on the radio. Uh, at our events, we're using radios now that don't even have a little dial with numbers on them. It just keeps turning. And on the top, on the front, is an LCD panel. It'll say officials, radio tour, et cetera, et cetera. The name is matched up to the frequency or the talk group or whatever we're using. So channels might be different on different radios. Uh, I went to Augusta to work Elite Nationals a few years ago, and they handed us this box of radios from the military base that they had scrounged that we could use. All the channels were set up differently on the radios. So, okay, we're going to use channel one today. Well, channel one on this radio is programmed different than that radio, than that radio, than that radio. So what I want to throw out to you guys is a channel is just an arbitrary designation. What you're looking for is that frequency. That's what's important. Some are consistent around the country. For instance, the FRS radios we talked about, they have channel 1 through 14. Those are the same wherever you go around the country. Channel 2 here is the same as channel 2 wherever. Uh, if I go between two local associations, even if the radios are the same, the channels may be different. So let's look at some common frequencies out there. I want to spend a lot of time on FRS radios. Who, uh, who owns an FRS radio? Okay, so the rest of you are going to be buying one. These are the most commonly used frequencies in the U.S. That's what they are. You don't need to worry too much about that. They're UHF. The big thing is there's 14 frequencies. I know if I come and work in Texas, and they're using FRS radios, and I'm from South Carolina, my channel one is their channel one. Within two miles of here, I guarantee you I could leave and buy one of these radios for probably 30 bucks. So very affordable, very common, very cheap. There are some rules to them. You don't need a license. Years ago, this had, you had to do family. That's why I call it family radio service. It couldn't be business. That's been done away with. So you can actually do business stuff on these. This is the big sort of limiting factor to these radios is they're limited to half a watt, which we'll talk about it in a lot of power you're putting out there. Some other things, they have non-removable antennas. You don't use them on repeaters. These are basically meant to talk almost line of sight. When you see these advertisements that this has 22 mile range, that's when one person's on top of Pikes Peak and the other person's on top of Mount Evans, and there's no clouds in the way, okay? Usually you're looking at uh, a mile or two of range, but these work really good in lieu of nothing else at a criterium, uh, work really well if you're in a small caravan at a local road race. Uh, what I suggest to all our new motor refs as they come up is that they need an FRS radio and a way to listen to it on the motor. And uh, if any of the motors are interested, I can talk to you. But that should be the basic kit that every official has is an FRS radio with some kind of earbud or a way to listen to it at a lot noisy criterion or if you're a motor, a way to plug into it. So get one of those in your, uh, in your kit. Better yet, and this is a couple examples. Uh, Motorola, they call them talkabouts, that's their name. Uh, those are Midlands or Unidens, I think. A few things with FRS radios I'd recommend. Uh, in the next slide, I'll show you some other things you want with this, but I like rechargeable ones where you just plug them in. There's a lot of them like these that will take regular double A's, but they come with a battery pack that you can just recharge. Uh, the other thing you want with these is some way to listen to them in your ear. Uh, who chief judges a lot at criteriums? Yeah, so me and Judy, I work on the motor a lot and she's chief judge. She's pretty good <laughs> about being able to hear up on stage. No, you're a great judge, but <clears throat> what's really important when we're looking at crisis management and criteriums and other things is the ability to actually hear up on stage. And I'll talk about that in a bit and give you some pointers on that. This one's got a little uh, thing on the side right here. You just open it up, you actually put your iPod earpieces in there. Really helpful if you're uh, at a noisy criterium.
GMRS. So this is very similar. Share some frequencies at the radios we just looked at. Same range of frequencies. 22 total. This is what I want to point out. You often see these as enhanced FRS radios or 22 channel FRS radios. If you're going shopping, get one of these. Okay, because it gives you some extra channels that aren't common. And the big thing is it lets you go up to five watts, which is 10 times the power of those little dink radios when you're on those specific channels. And you'll see these, they're called enhanced FRS radios or GMRS or long range radios. This is what I'm gonna recommend getting. And this is, uh, I bolded this. You technically need a license to operate on those frequencies. It's 85 bucks, it's a little form you fill out and it's good for five or 10 years. I think it's five years now. The, is this room bugged? I am being taped. The FCC has better things to do and chase everybody for not having a GM, GMRS license, but go ahead and just get one for the price they're asking. They actually assign you a call sign, believe it or not. And that's it, you can use these for the same things. Uh, we can use them at bike races. It's a pretty robust little system uh, for working locally. And you can set up repeaters with these. You can use them in all different types of radios, uh, those GMRS channels. This is what I'd recommend you buy and have in your bag. Here's another one. Who's from Mabra again? This is what you're using. I think, are you guys using these in Texas, do you know, the mirrors channels? So these are VHF channels. You don't have to write all this stuff down. This is going up online. So you're going to hear this if you go up and work with Jim Patton. He's like, oh, we're on mirrors too. And you're going, what? Again, I just want you guys to know what he's talking about and translate that language for you a little bit. And we'll talk about why this is different than the other radios. CB, stay away. <clears throat> the thing was, back in the day, these were very common. It was the only radio service out there that was affordable, and the only people who use it now are basically truckers on the highway. And you don't want to listen to that if you can help it. Okay, this is, uh, what I really wanted to cover is this is the item that confuses officials the most is using a radio repeater. Who, uh, who's used one before, sort of knows what they are, raise your hand. Okay, so a lot of folks. Who in here, anybody a ham radio operator? Okay, a few folks. So what's a repeater? It allows for extended range of radios. Our events, we fly our repeaters in an aircraft. It sits at 10,000 feet, and you can talk for 50 miles very easily. It just flies in circles all day above us, and the pilot's getting time. Anybody notice the antennas on top of the Marriott? I'm a radio geek, so that's the first thing I look at. It's the top of buildings. Uh, there are four repeaters in installed on top of the Marriott. If you go and look that way, when you walk out the front door, you see Cheyenne Mountain, and you see all the antennas on top. Half those are repeater antennas. So it uses equipment in a prime location like a building, mountaintop, aircraft, to really increase the footprint of how you communicate and the, your ability to communicate. For instance, the Marriott, every foot you go up gives you a half mile more range, more or less. So you throw something up on top of a building, and it really increases the ability to get to that antenna. So you have to program the radios to use this. There's specific channels set up to do it. And this is really important. If the repeater does not receive your signal, the person with the radio on the other end won't either. And that's why I think we've all stood around at bike races. They're using a repeater. And me and James have our radio on the repeater channel. And I key up, and I can't talk to him. He's 10 feet away. It's because you're not going up to that antenna. So this is what it looks like. <clears throat> You got a couple radios, and you got the repeater up on top of a mountain somewhere. So I'm transmitting on this frequency up, 
And the repeater grabs that signal. And it amplifies it, and it shoots it back out on this frequency, which is actually different. So I'm transmitting. These happen to be my frequencies I've licensed. I transmit on this. It grabs it, transmits it back out at 100 watts from that tall antenna, and this radio is picking it up. And then vice versa, when he transmits back, he's going back out at this and back down. Okay. So actually, your radio's got two different frequencies it's using on that channel. Now, what happens if that disappears? So I was transmitting out. Now I'm not able to. I'm in this building and can't hit that antenna up on top of the Marriott. I'm blocked. I can't get out to it. Is it's not repeating that signal back down to his radio. Everybody sort of get how that works? OK, because this causes a heck of a lot of confusion at bike races. He may be able to talk back the repeater, and I can hear it, but not the other way. Okay, That repeater is generally a lot stronger. It's got a huge antenna, taller than the ceiling in this room, and it's very powerful. So I may hear it, but I can't transmit back. That causes probably the biggest issues at bike races I see when we're using a repeater. I keep talking, and I hear them, but they don't hear me. Another term we throw out there is simplex. All that means is the radios are talking to each other now. You're taking that repeater out of the system. And I want to show you again, this is a little bit of theory. Here, we're using different frequencies. Here, it's the same. So what's happening is we're taking the repeater out of it, and the radios are just talking back and forth to each other. The words you guys will hear is simplex or talk around or tack. Those are sort of the three things that people use to denote that. All that means is your radios are talking to each other. When we say you're on the repeater, it's that. A couple types of radios. This is what we call a mobile radio. Some people call it a base radio or a car radio. The big benefit to this is a lot more power. These are putting out 25 to 100 watts. They use an external antenna, which is hugely important, and they don't require batteries. Uh, it is a given that your batteries and your radio will die with 10 kilometers going a bike race. <laughs> a little trick I'll throw out there for you that someone taught me is if you have a spare battery, put it in your radio before you need it with like 30K to go. And that way you have a fresh battery at the end of the race. Any of the LAs use these mobile radios? Okay. What's that? You have them? Okay. Obra's got them. So basically, you shove this in the car, you plug in the cigarette lighter, and you cram an antenna on the roof, and you have a really powerful radio. These, at the events I use, you know, five to eight miles of range. I, I think of it more as far as time splits go. One of the little FRS radios will go to about a minute and a half, two minutes when the brake gets up the road. A commercial radio will go four minutes. One of these will go seven, eight minutes when that brake gets up the road. Okay. Put it in terms of bike race officials. And this is what we call a portable or a handheld. Really easy to carry. Open up the case, throw in all your officials at the start of the race. Easy to move around. Delete the no batteries. I meant to put has batteries, but they're a lot less powerful. You look at the little antenna right there that's four or five inches long versus the three-foot antenna on top of the car. That's going to play a big difference here in a minute when we talk about the uh, hike and hear each other at bike races. So where do I get my radio from at a bike race? If the race director is providing it, a lot of times we're going out and renting these, and you get a really nice commercial radio that you can pound nails with, has a great battery on it, and maybe in part on a repeater system. Or you got a Redwinds and you get a really nice radio that's robust and you can pound batteries with, and it doesn't work. Might be on a proprietary system, must use their equipment. Why is this important to us as race officials, especially motor refs? 
What's that? Interface to intercom. There you go. And James, will want to expand on that a little? You've run into this. There you go. So I'm a motor ref and I go to a race and chief referees listen up. This is important for you guys to know. I'm a motor. I'm going to go to a race and I get handed this radio I've never seen before with this weird connector on the side with no speaker mic. How am I supposed to talk to you as my commissar? See why this is important? Right now, if that happens, our motor refs don't have the ability to talk to us. And we all know how important communications are. Chief referees, I suggest this is one of the questions you talk to your race directors about. If the organizer is providing these, uh, it's actually on the NRC checklist now after we get done with the event is what kind of radios and where are they on a repeater. That's something I'd ask ahead of time. So when James shows up or David or whoever, that they're able to actually interface with the system and talk to you. Most of the motors sort of get radios now. They may not have accessories, again, for motor refs, but that judge up on the stage, they get handed a hand mic, and that announcer is blaring out. you got Dave Toll next to you, and they've got the earplugs in, or the chief ref standing down the road right in front of the speakers. If you're a motor, I come at this from the motor end, and you've got a crash on the backstretch, that's important information. You need to get back to a variety of people. If the officials at the stage cannot hear it, might as well not have a radio, okay? So accessories are important, at least insisting critical people do. I uh, think Ryan's next door. He had a, uh, I was at Red Ones with him, and he brings these noise-canceling headsets and had the adapter to go to the radio, and he's up on stage just as serene as can be with his noise-canceling headset on, getting his work done and able to hear me when I was out on the road. So important stuff for you guys. Are there enough? Never, right? Okay. This is communications. Get to you. This is communications with the race director. Question? Yep. Yep. Yeah, let me, that's a good point. Let me tell you a quick story. So you guys saw the RF spectrum up there, that big, huge, geeky-looking document. Okay, the FCC divides that up in little tiny bands that we can use, and there's interference, which is probably what happened in your case. I was in an event running a command center for a pretty big event. Everything was going good. I was able to transmit on my radio. And about 10 o'clock, my radio just went dead. Like, I could hear people, but I couldn't transmit out. They couldn't hear me. What the hell? I mean, we were changing radios and antennas and trying to figure it out. And finally said, what's going on? What started at 10 o'clock to cause this issue? The DJ had started up. And I had her unplug every component of her sound system. And when she unplugged her big industrial CD player, I got radio comms back. And it was causing interference with our radio system. So that's probably what happened there. But, yeah, you can get a lot of interference up on stage. Uh, I've had officials key up mics on stage and the sound system go dead. So, not necessarily a bad thing, what's Dave told. <laughs> but are there enough? Again, chief referees especially, this is something to talk to your race directors about. And it's not just the officials. How are they set up for radio tour? How are they set up for the officials? How are the officials going to talk to medical? A lot going on there, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about that when we open this up for discussion. And are they appropriate? You know, Dan and me work Red Ones, and they give us these radios from the county, really nice radios. They work great in Red Ones, and we go to the edge of the county, and we just know there's spots on the Beaumont Road Race Course where these radios aren't going to work. And we'd be better off with two little FRS radios talking to each other instead of these fancy $1,000 radios they're giving us. Every organizer I know says, oh, yeah, we've gone out and tested them. They worked on Wednesday. You know, they're just not doing it. This is something, again, as chief referees, I think you really need to hammer your race directors on, especially at bigger races where this is critically important. 
and are there enough channels? Uh, when I was just starting out on the technical side of things, I, I just really didn't understand radio tour versus officials channel, and I did a really big NRC race. I was a tech guy for in Mississippi, and we just handed the radios out and had the officials, radio tour, everything on the same channel. Uh, yeah, it worked, but it was not pretty. So it, Red Ones, uh, again, as an example, you know, they call their radio tour caravan. We call it radio tour everywhere else in the country, and it just confuses the heck out of everybody. So that's some nomenclature uh, you all should get used to adapting. I would suggest there be a dedicated channel for race officials, and this is in our sea level caravan type stuff, a dedicated channel for race officials, a channel for radio tour, race information, and an operations channel for the organization because it gets really awkward when we're trying to run time splits and it's 10K into a race and everything's going on and we get that call about they need more toilet paper in the portalettes. Uh, have we all not experienced that before? That's the Red Ones radio that we get, <laughs> I like to say. <clears throat> yeah, Dan's in charge of handing out batteries every morning, the C batteries. Okay, again, what, whose LAs provide the radios for them? Great. Okay, these are usually known to officials. So in the Carolinas, uh, our motors show up, and they know it takes a two-pin Motorola adapter on the side. We just, even if they don't know anything about radios, we work this out with them. Everybody can plug into them, and they're known to you guys. Probably not on a repeater. There's all kind of radios out there. Uh, GD, we have not succeeded in losing ours in the lake yet. I'm going to dump those sometime into the ocean. Uh, we have some old junky ones. There's some really good stuff. I know you guys have Motorola's in Texas. Mabris got nice Vertex commercial radios. Uh, USA Cycling, a few years ago, decided we're going to go and purchase radios to use at all our national championships. And Micah didn't ask anybody about it. And they went and bought these ham radios that are programmable and had to modify them. Has uh, anybody used those at the Nationals? Yeah. Hey, uh, what did you say? There you go. <laughs> so uh, if you're a local association and you're going to buy radios, go to a professional radio company, tell them what you're using them for, and get something, pay the extra money, and get something robust, commercial grade, and... You guys now are indoctrinated a little bit into what a frequency is, but you want something an official can turn on and say, we're on channel one, and they turn it on, and it just works. Someone has to be in charge of transport, charging, et cetera. Uh, don't give that to your motor rest. We get really cranky. We have a big Pelican case strapped to the back of our motorcycle. Okay. Owned by officials. Again, I think everyone should have a GMRS, FRS radio. It goes without saying. Key thing, will your radios talk to the other ones? James, you work uh, our events a lot. Will your personal radio work with Metalist Radio? No. Okay. So we've had to adapt. We actually spent $2,000 to custom make adapters so that our motor rest could listen to our radios. That's what it took in that case. So we use a really special system. But will your radios talk to other people out there? If you have a local association radio and you own your own radio, you want to talk to some folks and make sure that it's going to work together. For instance, if you guys have VHF and I have a UHF radio, we're going to have a problem because I'm going to show up and it's not going to work. Allows you to set up your equipment as you like it, uh, again, especially for motors, but also for judges, being able to turn your noise-canceling mic on without killing everybody else on the stage. And you take on the support of the radio for good and the bad. And they're not cheap. Okay. So how to improve reception. It's all about the radio antenna. Okay, that little stubby, tiny thing on top of that little handheld radio. Uh, who has radio chest harnesses they use? Okay. Uh, I, I've always used one on a motor. They're really good when you're talking to people in front of you, but when you're talking to people behind you, it's got to penetrate through your body, believe it or not. 
Radios don't like going through water, and you're 90-something percent water. Also, the radio is usually tilted. Radios work really well, or antennas work really well when you're holding the radio up really high and the antenna is pointed straight up in the air. They're actually designed to radiate out that way. If you have it on your chest harness or turned sideways in your tank bag or down clipped to the bottom of your car door, what's that going to do to your antenna performance? Okay. Uh, and I hate to say this, but bigger is better. Uh, generally, bigger antennas are going to provide more reception and more range. That's why antennas on top of cars, the little mag mounts or the big mag mounts work a lot better. What I've taken to doing now is my on my motor, my radio goes clipped on the side of my tank bag with the antenna pointed straight up because that provides better reception. David? Andy, do you have one that you plug into your ham radio? That goes, or is that, that's Andy Taos had one. Okay. A lot of the guys, they'll have a, a handheld and they have a little antenna that screws into it and goes on top of the car. Why is that important? Cars are not your friends with radios. Okay. Every auto manufactured in the last 10 years has a special coating on the windows. You know what that does? Keeps the sun out. Okay. It keeps the rays from coming in and fading your interior. Anybody know what the difference between rays from the sun and radio waves are? It's only about three gigahertz. So <laughs> it's the same thing. It's radiation. You have a coating on your windscreen to keep the sun out. That keeps your radio waves from going out of a car, believe it or not. Radio waves, look at your microwave is a great example. Take your cell phone sometime. Don't turn it on, but throw it in your microwave and close the door. Let it sit for a few seconds and pull it out and see how many bars it shows you. It's basically like putting it inside a car. Okay, it blocks radio waves from going out. Uh, I've actually worked races where I've had a speaker mic and a radio, and I can't hear the official. I roll the window down, stick the radio out, and use the speaker mic, and magic. Okay, some little tips and tricks for you. Cars are not your friend as far as uh, radio waves go. Having the radio up higher in the car, having an external antenna make a huge difference. Don't let it sit on the floor. Clip your, clip your radio down there with the speaker mic. Uh, VHF, that's one thing I want to bring up. VHF radios, which Mabry uses, Texas uses, and you may be handed an event, and that's that 150 to 160 megahertz, are horrible at penetrating out of walls or buildings or whatnot. Okay? That's why UHF radios tend to be used a lot more. All other things being equal, VHF will transmit further, and UHF will handle obstacles better. Cell phones, we all use them inside buildings. Going back to theory, the minimum frequency of this is 800, and it goes up to 2100 megahertz. It can go right through that wall. A VHF radio will not do that. Okay. The way I remember this is our sheriff's department uses VHF because they're out in the country and they're not in buildings, and our city uses UHF because they're all in the basements of buildings. So just a little guideline for you. If you're using a VHF radio handheld in a vehicle, you're probably going to have issues once people get up the road a little bit. That's why it might be good to stick it out the window or get that external antenna. Power makes a difference. Mike was laughing a little when I was talking time splits. FRS, one to two minutes, break up the road. Commercial, five watt radio, three, four minutes. Last weekend, we got to four and a half minutes before I lost my motor. We were using these. A big mobile car mount radio, six to seven minutes. That's a full power. Ah, uh, that's 25. Two car radios, yep. And that's a great point. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, talk about relaying well on the road, getting ahead of ourselves a little. Uh, I work, again, as a motor a lot. I've got my little handheld. We've got two commissaires in cars with big vehicle-mounted radios. I may be able to hear them because they're throwing out all this wattage, and they can't hear me. So that's something to take into consideration when you're positioning folks. 
is the commissaires, you may in between them, they may be able to talk back and forth, and you with your dink little radio can't. So I like having Jim Patton at the races, you know, he's throwing out a bunch of wattage and has an antenna taller than him and can generally talk to the world. So uh, it makes a difference. A lot of times we'll relay using someone in between as well because of that. There are a lot of cases, to Mike's point, where the car can talk to you and you can hear them, but not vice versa because of the power. Give you an idea, a typical radio station puts a big antenna on top of a mountain that's cranking out about 50,000 watts. Everybody's heard the commercial, 100,000 watts of power. That's what they're throwing out, and you get it for 100 miles. Make sure you can hear your audio. This is a Chuck pet peeve for judges especially. Please make sure you can hear the officials out on the road, and there's a lot of ways to set that up. Uh, mainly with coming up with some kind of system that works for you. Any of the judges in here have particular systems they use? Noise canceling, I heard anything else? Judy, I want you to hear me at Presbyterian this year. Okay. So I'm going to open this up and we'll have some good discussions. We've been through the theory, talked some practicality. One thing I want to throw out, if you're on a repeater system or any radio system you use, it's a really good idea to key the radio, let your breath out, and then talk. Anybody know why we say, if I'm motor one and I'm calling comm one, I say motor one to comm one instead of vice versa? There you go. So if I get cut off on the front end, comm one at least knows who I'm talking to. That's because we have a lot of new officials especially who key up a radio and start talking immediately or start talking before they key it up. So that's point number one, I think, is press the button, take a breath, and then start talking. Okay? Open it up some questions from you guys. I don't know if Tom's around. For the FRS radio. I don't know. Let's get the mic. Sorry, we got it. we're recording this. For the, for the FRS radio, as you mentioned, putting an earbud into it, is it just a listen earbud and you still got to talk into the radio, or can it be the listen and the little microphone on the earbud thing. Okay, great question about accessories. Uh, you can really do it both ways. All of these radios have different types of connectors attached to them. Uh, I at least suggest you be able to hear, especially if you're a judge up on the stage. Uh, there's a lot of different accessories. What I would do is just Google it, and Planet Headset's a good one that has all kind of accessories for radios. Uh, Motorola makes specific ones. They make, uh, we get our judges what they call their lightweight headset, and it's a over-the-air headset with a boom mic, an earpiece, and a push to talk. So our judges can sit up on a stage, listen, and also talk back. It's got some noise canceling stuff in it. A lot of the speaker mics you get now, which is the, you have the radio attached to your belt or whatever, the cable, and then a speaker mic, have a little flap on it on the side, and you can plug in a, hear, a earpiece. Just like on your iPod, it's a little 3.5 jack, so you can hear and still transmit over the speaker mic. Good question. <laughs> they can't hear you on if the I web. Okay. You're, good. You're good. Okay, if I can just make a comment. It's estimated a quarter of the American population has hearing disabilities, and those things are not detectable. And that uh, really makes it important to use proper radio procedure. And the example I'd like to give is a motor ref that I know who has a hearing disability. And using proper radio procedure, it's actually easier to talk to him uh, over the radio than in person. And uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, so-and-so to so-and-so, and just using all that stuff correctly or phonetic alphabet, things like that. That's a great point. Now, I kept this more on the equipment level, but we can talk some uh, sort of radio protocol. Uh, the biggest one to me, and Sean and I joked about this, is whether he's going to have to ha change his hailing practices. Uh, you know, my preference I've used is who I am calling who I want to call. And again, the reason is it's a lot easier to clip the first part of that transmission. The other thing with officials for you guys on radios is just brevity. And we all get bored out there at races, and it's, you know, we're working a cat pool race as a motor and a comm, and no one's around, and we, we chit-chat a little bit. But uh, you'll hear a good radio operator. I listen to and deal a lot with ham radio guys, 
and they'll be carrying on conversations and it's become second nature for them is one of them will finish a conversa- his part of the conversation and he'll unkey his mic and the other guy will not start for a few seconds. Uh, and they'll carry on a 20 minute conversation but if I'm on the road and I have an emergency, I can jump on there and say break. And when they hear break, they quit talking and let me talk. So brevity is really important, not tying up the radio and also leaving a chance for other folks to jump in there when needed, okay? Uh, Another thing I'll bring up is open mics. (laughs) Uh, Who has autocoms whose motor's in here? Okay, so the autocom, for those of you who don't know motorcycle stuff, it's got a little push-to-talk switch on the handlebar, and it's got a toggle switch, and if you happen to hit the toggle switch the wrong way, it basically just keys your mic. I'm, undo that, yeah. <laughs> so you, you key, you toggle that little switch, and everybody can hear everything you say, everything Jim Patton's talking to the riders about when it's him out on course. Uh, the folks at our event, the first motor to do that on a particular event buys dinner for the rest of the crew is our rule. Uh, you can disconnect it. A general rule, if you're not hearing people talking back to you, especially at a busy race, something's wrong. Okay, because you guys all know have worked on how, how busy races can get on the radio. Uh, the other part of that, if, you, if your local association owns radios, you can program what's called a timeout timer on those radios. So what happens is I have mine set at 60 seconds, and if you key the radio for more than 60 seconds, it goes and quits transmitting. And then you turn red and switch your autocom switch back to the central position. That can be set. We set it at 60 seconds. The only person who ever keys it is Lauren Rhodes doing radio tour. And she wants to know why our radio is making noise, and I don't tell her. So. <laughs> this is being recorded, right? <laughs> Hope she doesn't watch it. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Get on that. You, you talked about repeaters and simplex, so I thought maybe you should talk a little bit about um, people using simplex uh, with other people still on the repeater and how that okay. can work well. Yeah, this is going to get a little complicated. I'll go back and show you guys. I tried to avoid too much theory, but I want you guys to get this. Okay, so this is what it looks like when we're transmitting up to a repeater. We're transmitting on this frequency. We're hearing back on that. Okay. Anybody sort of got that in their brain? What happens is that if we lose, so this radio is getting complicated, but this radio is transmitting at this frequency and receiving at this frequency. Okay. You got everybody got sort of this picture. If the repeater goes down, the way we program our radios, and most people do is that if you are on the repeater channel and everybody else goes to their simplex or tac channel, we talked about what that was, you can still hear, but you can't transmit back. And the way that works is we go to... Simplex is a repeat. Yeah, so what happens is that... I don't have it set up on here, but all the radios receive at this. So when this radio goes to simplex, it's programmed this way, and this guy's hearing it. It's normally, the simplex is normally the channel the repeater throws out. So you can't talk back to it, but you can at least hear it. And the way we, reason we set that up is our airplane has to fly away for fuel. Or maybe you're getting to the area where the repeater's not covering it, or it goes down. You can switch to that simplex and say, okay, everybody switch over to simplex. They can't talk back to you, but they can hear you telling that. Just remember, you're not going to have that extended range. So, if you go to simplex and someone's still un- repeater. able to get something from the repeater, and they can hear you. <coughs> Correct. So that's okay. So, for everybody on the web, what's important on that again is you can at least hear them. If you haven't switched your radio off that repeater channel, you can hear everybody else talking on simplex, and you'll wonder why they can't hear you. So, Tom? Chuck, are there any uh, guidances, uh, guidances of clear don'ts from either like an FCC standpoint or other radio governance body, what we should not do? Uh, yeah, great question, Tom. Uh, yeah, let me uh, go back to the geek page, the real geek page. Uh, 
Uh, well, so yeah, there are. The FCC, there we are. So that's it. This is everything. This is, uh, this is our UHF spectrum. So this is 450 to 470 megahertz. Within that, 450 to 470 megahertz is commercial, you know, everybody from the paving company, the parking company, to whoever's using a, a radio, FRS radios, police systems, city public works, EMS, biomedical paging, which is stuff in hospitals, is all in that little tiny spectrum of yellow. So what happens, and this has happened to us, if the frequency you put in the little programmable radio that you bought and thought you know how to use, if you put in the local police frequency in there. Okay, yeah. We had a situation in California, we actually frequency coordinate Every state has a frequency coordinator. Somehow it slipped through that our expo channel was the output of the, or input of the police repeater, a spare repeater. So basically anybody who was close in a police car heard us talking about we need, you know, ice at the engine booth. Uh, so to Tom's point, almost all this stuff's licensed. Uh, I actually, for my commercial stuff for my business, have licenses for everything, and they cost me 400 bucks a year. The GMRS frequencies are licensed for $85, you saw that. FRS are free to use, and they are tiny little slice of that yellow. One thing we see a lot at uh, races is the Euro teams come over here. Uh, until recently, when all the riders could use radios, and they have those little tiny credit card-like radios, those are actually, a company in Holland makes them, and they are ham radios, which they sit, they sit right here, just to the left of that yellow that we're supposed to use. So they're transmitting on ham frequencies, which they're not supposed to do. And I've actually had ham clubs complain about it because it's emergency communications. It could be hitting repeaters. The FCC, if you go on their website, there's a whole long list of complaint letters from them to people with fines from ten to twenty-five thousand dollars to companies who are, you know, going down the store grabbing a ham radio and using it for commercial purposes on those frequencies. So, really important stuff to know what you're doing. If you have a commercial radio or if you have a programmable radio, don't just throw frequencies into it because you may end up. My frequency, you saw it there, four five one eight zero zero is like that far away from our city's public works channel, which is on a repeater. So if I just program something wrong, I'm keying up every city employee's radio in 30 mile radius. So important stuff, good, good question. Okay, Chuck, um, a lot of times our motos out on the road, which are very important for us, we can't hear them. They can't hear us. Other than putting a temporary fix on their bike, is there something that we can do with the antennas so they can increase that range? Sure, question about antennas, and this applies on cars as well, if you have a handheld radio. There are actually adapters that you unscrew the antenna off the handheld radio. I should have pulled up my web browser. I won't worry about it. You uh, unscrew the antenna, you screw this on, and it lets you put a mag mount antenna either on top of the car or attached to your motorcycle. And that's personally what I use. I have about a three foot whip antenna on my motorcycle and a little cable that runs into my handheld radio and it uh, dramatically increases the usability of it. But there's gonna come a point, no matter what you have, unless you're you know, 100,000 watts, you're gonna run out of transmitting range. It's just the way the physics work of the thing. Uh, I would suggest if you have an LA that has the handhelds, I know you guys use VHF down there. It might be good to look at just some of those mag mount antennas and screw them into the handhelds. If you're in a car, it's really dramatically gonna increase your range. I think, question up here? What's that? Uh, two things. Uh, if you guys have got a business band radio that you're using now and you have not narrow banded it for this year, the FCC is already requiring those radios to be taken in and changing the frequencies so they double the frequency spaces 
inside the, our, uh, our particular bands. And the other one you're talking about, well, you'd have to take all your radios in and have them reprogrammed. It's not that easy to do by yourself, but you can do it if you have the software. But that's a requirement as of, what, February this mm -hmm. year? Uh, and we still have to do it, of course, in Texas. That's one thing. And the other thing is that we were talking about headsets and uh, listening on the stage. And depending upon how difficult it is to hear, you can go whatever range you want with what kind of earpiece you use, everything from a surveillance in the ear piece to your headsets to your noise canceling headphones, whatever works for you. But whatever gets the sound into your particular ear without the other sound leaking in. Yeah. It certainly be a help to you. Same thing with a microphone. Whatever yep. you're using is a microphone. Headset. The little things that clip on your ear that have inductive microphones. That doesn't work with Dave Tolman. Or a throat time. mic. <laughs> yes. Not, I mean, whatever works for you for a motor. A motor, sometimes a throat mic is the best way to go. Uh, but talk to them about what, uh, what the best things are for each individual usage. High noise, low noise, hearing, speaking, whatever you need to do. Yep. And that's, uh, that's a great point as far as you know, what works for you guys, what works with your radios. Uh, the basic thing, if you go on eBay and look for 20, 30 bucks, it's not the best sound quality. They work. The little secret service type things. It's a wire with a little coil that fits in your ear. Mine's custom molded to my ear, so it just is more comfortable. Get those for 30 bucks. I keep one in my event bag, you know, just throw it in there. The narrow banding, it's a little above the scope of this. If you guys do have LA radios, I think ours are set. Uh, what's happened is that spectrum you saw right there, that's worth a lot of money. All those little, uh, each of these squares. So this right here, that little section, that's worth about $3 billion to cell phone companies. The FCC actually auctions little bits of this off. AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, billions with a B of dollars. So what they've done is taken this and sliced it ever thinner when the technology's gotten better. And they're requiring everybody who has radios to program them to hit that little thin slice instead of that bigger slice is what that means. If you do have LA radios, you probably want to look into that. I think we have one more question in the back. Behind you. I think I thought Richard had one. I, I've never really paid a lot of attention. Is it possible to put a, a better antenna on an FSR radio? Okay, FRS radios uh, being videotaped here. The FCC may see this. Uh, the rule with FRS radios, one of the rules is it's a non-removable antenna. You can actually program those frequencies into the bigger radios. Technically, you're not supposed to. I haven't told you to do that. But no, you, on an FRS radio, if you go buy one at the store, by law, the antenna is non-detachable, so you cannot do that. But they will; those frequencies will program into programmable radios. I'm not telling you to do that. Okay. And can transmit up to 100 watts, even though it's supposed to be a half watt. I'm not telling you to do that. And you will not interfere with police frequencies, but I'm not telling you to do that. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. There's a lot of good resources. Uh, Jim Patton's a great resource. He helped with a lot of this. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people in the local associations who know this stuff. If you have any questions, my suggestion is find your local person who knows what they're talking about and get set up because this is a critically important part of being a bike race official. Now, hopefully, you know when someone says mirrors or GMRS or I'm on 462.6875, you at least have an inkling of what the heck they're talking about. And I can talk intelligently and hammer your race directors on this stuff too. If you're, especially if it's a big event, is uh, ask these questions about how many radios, what kind they are, how are we going to attach to them? And if you don't know the questions to ask, get with someone on your crew who does, because they are more than willing to find out so they can talk to you. Okay, one more. Attaching a large antenna to your handheld radio, does it kill the battery faster? Question, attaching a big radio to your handheld, no, it does not kill the battery any faster. Uh, battery is how much you transmit and how it's programmed and how much power it's programmed to put out. Uh, I know a lot of officials who kill radios really quickly. It's because they're talking a lot. <laughs> a, radio, uh, <laughs> a radio transmits, transmitting takes 10, 15 times the power, if not more, than receiving. 
Uh, there are certain officials who get extra batteries at our events. I'll just leave it at that and not say who they are. Good question. Okay. All right, I think that's all we have time for. Hope it's helpful for you guys. Feel free to ask questions if you need. <laughs> Thank you.